And I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Cause Jesus paid it all. No. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Lord, now indeed I find thy power in thine alone can change the leper's spot. Jesus paid it all, and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. And when before the throne, I stand in him complete. Jesus died my soul to sing. My lips shall still repeat. Cause Jesus paid it all. No, to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson. He was it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. And no, oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who. Paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised his life up from the dead. Cause Jesus paid it all and all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us once again for our Together Wherever worship service here at Central Baptist Church. And um, I'm so glad that you could join us this morning. Um, like always, I'd like to ask you if you could please like and share this on your Facebook page so we can get God's word out to as many people as possible. Make sure that your family and friends, especially those that may not be saved, can hear this message this morning. And for our parents, don't forget to go to our CBC Kids page um, for the Bible lesson this morning for our children. Well, this morning we're going to continue our study through the Gospel of John. Um, and once again, I want to remind you of the theme of, of John's Gospel. In John chapter 20. Uh, verse 30, he says, Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Well, this morning we're going to look at one of uh, another one of those uh, miraculous signs that John talks about. Um, last week we studied in uh, what was probably you could call Jesus' most famous miracle, the feeding of the 5,000. And I told you last week that the feeding of the 5,000 is the first miracle that John records that we know was witnessed by all 12 of his disciples. And I also want to remind you that um, about just how great this miracle was. Because not only did Jesus feed 5,000 men plus women and children with a little boy's lunch, but he did it by creating when Jesus multiplied the loaves and the fishes, he didn't make something that was fish-like. 
He didn't make something that was bread-like. He created fish and he created bread. Only God, only the true God can create. Now, and to verify that this wasn't an illusion, and believe me, there are skeptics out there that say, well, he didn't really multiply it. It's just that when he prayed, um, they all felt full. Well, John refutes that strongly in verse 12 of chapter 6. In verse 12, he said, when they all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. Let me tell you something. You can't gather pieces of an illusion. It's impossible. I also want to remind you that all of this would have taken some time. It would have taken time to distribute food to thousands of people. Remember, this is 5,000 men plus women and children. You know, here for the last couple of weeks on Thursday morning, we've been um, distributing milk and a few food boxes. And this week, um, we had 60, 60 boxes of milk and 20 boxes of food. And it took us, I would say, about 45 minutes to deliver those boxes of food. Not deliver, but put in the cars of those who were driving by. So imagine what it would take to feed thousands, to distribute this food out to thousands. And then how much time would it take to go back through the crowd and gather up all of these, um, these leftovers? This was, a, this was a big deal. And it was that way on purpose. Jesus did this so that his disciples could not only witness this great miracle, but they could be a part of it. They needed this to be hands-on. They needed to be a part of this miracle because their faith was about to get tested once again. Now, I say once again because John tells us that this feeding, this miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 was exactly that. It, it was a test. In verse 5, um, John records this. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming toward him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? Now, look at this, verse 6. He asked this only to test him for he already had in mind what he was going to do. And Matthew, in his account, in verse 16 of chapter 14, says, Jesus told them, he said, they do not need to go away. They came to him and said, you know, dismiss all these people, let them go somewhere and find something to eat. He said, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. So Jesus was testing his disciples. This was to help grow their faith. Now, as I said this morning, we're going to be looking at the fifth miracle that is recorded by John. And this miracle we also find in chapter 6. So if you've got your Bibles, I encourage you to open up and follow along with us. We're going to begin in, in verse 12. And while you're doing that, just a little uh, FYI. You know what that is, right, for your information? Just a little side note here. You know, most people know about the feeding of the 5,000. Like I said, it's probably his most famous miracle, one that is taught the most out of all the miracles um, to children and, and adults alike. But many don't know that this isn't the only time that Jesus fed a multitude with very little. Matthew and Mark both record the story of another time when Jesus fed 4,000 men. Now, we know these are two separate events because these two authors, Matthew and Mark, also record the feeding of the 5,000. Now, we're not going to look at those. We're not going to read those. I'll let you study those for yourself. And if you'd like to, you can write this down. You'll find Matthew's account in chapter 15. And Mark um, writes about the feeding of the 4,000 in chapter 8 of his gospel. So let's begin in John 6, 12 with, uh, with part of our reading for today. When they had all had enough to eat, they, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled twelve baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign Jesus did, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and, and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and they set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. Now the other gospel accounts tell us that Jesus told his disciples to get into the boat and to go ahead of him while he dismissed the crowd. John tells us in verse 15 that Jesus withdrew to a mountain by himself. He said withdrew again because Jesus often did this. Um, Matthew tells us that Jesus went there to pray by himself, which again, he would often do. 
So John tells us that by the time they left, it was already dark which indicates, again, that this dinner, this, this feeding of the 5,000, the gathering of the leftovers, this took a long time. And then we see in verse 18, John jumps to this. He says, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. Before we go on, let's pray. Lord, I pray as we look at this, uh, this next miracle this morning, Lord, as we continue this study um, through the gospel of John, Lord, I pray that you would touch our hearts in a great way. Lord, once again, I pray that we would put all the the cares of this world aside. Lord, that we would concentrate on your word this morning. Lord, that we would concentrate on you. Lord, I pray that you would stretch our faith this morning, Lord, just as you increase the faith of your disciples through these miracles. Lord, I pray as we study this and as we make application, Lord, that too our faith would grow in you. Lord, we pray that you're honored and glorified by this message this morning. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, John doesn't go into a lot of detail about this storm. But um, like most other lakes, especially those that are completely surrounded by mountains, storms can come up at a moment's notice. And they can be extremely violent, um, causing, um, coming up very quickly and causing very turbulent waves. And evidently, that is what happened here. In fact, Matthew's version of the story says that the ship was buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. And Mark writes this in Mark 6, 48. He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Now, I want you to remember this morning, several of Jesus' disciples were seasoned sailors and fishermen. They knew this sea well, which tells us at least two things. First of all, they were used to being on the lake even at night. As a matter of fact, if you look at, the, at two of the other miracles of Jesus, both of them what they call um, when um, the, the great draught of fish, when Jesus told them to cast their nets on the other side, both times they indicated that they had been fishing all night long. So this was nothing unusual for them to get into a boat and to go out on the Sea of Galilee at night. The second thing is I'm sure that this wasn't their first storm. As I said, the Sea of Galilee is known, just as any other lake surrounded by mountains, for all of a sudden um, having a storm whip up. Now, I've never been at sea in a big storm. I've never been on a lake on a big storm. But I was in a canoe once on a lake that wasn't near this big, and the wind started to blow against me. It was a lot of work just to get that canoe back to where I wanted it to go. Well, this wasn't their first storm. And being seasoned fishermen, they never would have started across this sea if a storm was already brewing. So the disciples probably had no idea that this story, that this storm was coming. But I have a feeling Jesus did. In fact, I know he did. It goes on in verse 19. They said, when they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. The Sea of Galilee is actually a lake, as I said. In fact, it's the largest freshwater lake, lake um, in Israel. The Dead Sea um, is larger, but, but it's, it's an actual saltwater sea. But it's a pretty good-sized lake. It has a surface area of about 64 square miles, a maximum depth um, of about 157 feet in the north end of, this, um, of the lake, which is where this takes place. It is 13 miles long from north to south, and at its widest point, also toward the lake, it's kind of kidney-shaped, it's seven miles from east to west. Now, Luke tells us that the feeding of the 5,000 took place near near Bethsaida. And if you remember last week, I said that possibly why why Jesus specifically asked Philip about this, because Philip was was from, from the area. Now, Bethsaida is on the northwest side of the sea. So in other words, if you were looking at a map, from north to south, and again, it's kind of kidney-shaped. Bethsaida would be in the, north, the northeast part, about 1 o'clock, let's say. Mark tells us in Mark 6, 45, that immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to Bethsaida while he dismissed the crowd. So Jesus wasn't actually in the city. We know he's on a mountainside. How far from Bethsaida, whether he was north of it, south of it, we don't know. But he was somewhere near this town. And Mark says that their original destination was to head to Bethsaida, which wouldn't have been that far away. Mark then later in his gospel tells us that they landed at Genesaret. Now, Genesaret is a town that is on the, um, that is on the northwest side 
um, of the sea about 10 o'clock. So we're going from this side of the sea on the north end to about that side. So apparently, if you put all this together, the disciples weren't actually trying to make it clear across the sea, but the storm was so violent that it blew them way off course. Again, verse 19 tells us that they had rowed about three or three and a half miles. And remember, they were straining against the wind. They had rowed about three or three and a half miles when they saw Jesus approaching. Well, according to the map, and I got my map out um, of the Sea of Galilee on my Bible app program, and I measured off of their, um, uh, their, little, uh, um, their little measurement thing there. And from Bethsaida to Gennesaret is about five to five and a half miles away, depending on which side of the city they were on. So that means the disciples were about two-thirds of the way across. In other words, they still had probably a mile or a mile and a half to go before they would reach shore. And it's then that they see Jesus walking on the water. And again, John doesn't give us a lot of detail here, but the other gospel writers do. In fact, Matthew 14, 25 says, During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. Now, by Roman standard of time, the fourth watch was sometime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., which means that um, if they left just as it was getting dark, then uh, they had been fighting this storm for quite some time, for, for several hours. Mark confirms the time, and he adds one more detail. It says, about the fourth watch of the night, he went out to them. This, is, this would be Jesus walking on the lake. He was about to pass them by. <laughs> Did you see that? He was walking on the lake, about to pass them by. Now, here they are in a storm. They're rowing like crazy, fighting the storm. They thought they were going to Bethsaida. They've been pushed three and a half miles out on, on this lake. And they look up and they see somebody walking right past them. Now, remember, it's a storm and an intense storm. And I want you to remember that not only from the, the standpoint of the disciples, but sometimes when we see this story in our minds, we see Jesus just walking along on the water. We forget how bad the conditions were that he was walking in. This was not a stroll in the park, not even for the Son of God. And also, I don't think for one minute that he didn't know exactly where they were as he was walking by them. And yet here he is just walking past them, headed to the other side. Now, at this point in the story, both Matthew and Mark add another fact to the story that John leaves out. In verse 19, John says this. He says, when they had rowed three or three and a half miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were terrified. But look at what Matthew and, and Mark add to this. Matthew says in verse 26 of chapter 14, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. Now, we look at that and we think, how silly. But why wouldn't they think it was a ghost? What else would it be? What else could it be? Men can't walk on water. And Jesus wasn't supposed to be meeting them there. He was supposed to be back at Bethsaida or waiting for them there at Bethsaida. So here they are in the middle of the sea, in the middle of the night, in the middle of a storm, and here comes a ghost or what they thought was a ghost. So what do they do? The Bible says they cry out in fear. But then all of a sudden, they hear a familiar voice. And John tells us in verse 20, he says, but he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. The phrase that is translated here, it is I, literally means I am. In fact, we see these same words, these same Greek words in chapter 8 when Jesus would say it again. This time he is, um, uh, he, is, he is arguing with the Pharisees or he's discussing with them in the temple. And he tells them, he says, I tell you the truth, before Abraham was born, I am. The next verse says that this, they picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus hid himself, slipping away from the temple crowd. Well, why did they pick up stones to stone Jesus? Because they knew full well what he was implying when he said, but before Abraham was born, I am. He was declaring himself to be God. If you remember back in the Old Testament, when Moses or when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, he tells him he wants him to go back to Egypt. Um, and stand before Pharaoh. He wants him to go back and he wants to, he's going to have him lead his people out. And so Moses asked him, he says, well, well, what should I say to them when I get there? And in Exodus 3, 13, it says, Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. And they ask me, what is his name? 
then what shall I tell them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are say to, say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. So here in our story, the disciples see Jesus walking on the water. They think it's a ghost. They're crying out to God in fear. And Jesus says, don't be afraid. I am. In other words, God, Jehovah, is here. Now, at this point in the story, we have to turn once again to Matthew because he's the only writer who records this next part of the story. And in Matthew 14, 26, he says this, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I, don't be afraid. Verse 28 says, Peter replied to him, Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and he began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Now, Matthew doesn't tell us how far Peter walked on the water, only that he got out of the boat and he began to walk toward Jesus. Now, how cool would that be? You know, last week um, in this message, I sat on a, um, on a hillside in San Diego, and I thought about, you know, preaching this um, to you from a lake. But the problem was every time I thought about stepping on the water, I didn't think I could stand on it. I figured I would, I would sink. And, you know, sitting in a boat just wouldn't be the same thing. But Peter, Peter does it. He gets out of the boat. He walks for a while on water to Jesus. How cool would that be? But then all of a sudden, Peter looks around. And he remembers where he is. He's in the middle of the night, in the middle of the sea, in the middle of a storm. And he gets scared. He begins to sink. At that point, he cries out to Jesus, save me. Well, the Bible says that Jesus reached out his hand and he caught him. John finishes his story this way. In verse 20, he says, he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. The other gospels tell us that when they reached the boat, the storm stopped as suddenly as it had started. John says immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. By this phrase, by him saying immediately the boat reached the, sh the shore, he could have meant that the rest of the trip went smoothly uh, and it seemed like they were there in no time. But I'm not so sure about that. I think this was just another part of the miracle. In fact, I believe we see four miracles taking place in this story. The first one we see is Jesus walking on water. The second one we see is Peter walking on water. Both of those obviously are miracles. They can't be done. The third miracle we see is that when Jesus gets into the boat, he instantly and immediately calms the storm. Nobody but God can do that. And then the boat was immediately at the shore. I think they were so tired. They were so relieved. I don't think they had to row that extra mile or so. All of these things prove that Jesus is God. And what is John's purpose in writing this book? He says, many other things have been written, but these miracles are here that you may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by, that by, that by believing you may have life in his name. Only God can command the wind and the waves. You know, as I said, this is probably the most famous miracle of all. It's one of the most, probably most told stories, especially in, in children's church and in Sunday school and stuff like that. Um, there's a lot that we can learn from this story, though. There are many spiritual applications that we can make. This morning, I want to share two of them with you. The first one has to do with the disciples' fear and with Peter walking by faith and then sinking because of a lack of faith. You know, there's a great lesson in that, and it's a simple lesson, and this is usually the one most taught. In times of trouble, in the midst of a storm, we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, not on the storm. Psalms 33, 18 says, The eyes of the Lord are on those who fear Him, on those whose hope is in His unfailing love, to deliver them from death and keep them alive in famine. In Psalms 34, 15, He says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are attentive to their cries. 
Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. And Hebrews 4, 13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. You know, Jesus' eyes are always on you. He's always watching over you. He's always watching out for you. Keep your eyes on him. Don't look around you. Keep your eyes on him. Focus on him because that's where the answers are. The next point has to do with the storm itself. Remember, the disciples had no idea that this storm was coming. All, all they knew is that Jesus said, go down and get in a boat, and they went. Jesus would never send them into, into trouble. He loved them. He was their master. He was their rabbi. He told them what to do, and they did it. However, Jesus, being God, knowing all things, he knew that this storm was coming, and he sent them anyway. What that means is he sent them into the storm. Did you get that? He sent them into the storm. In fact, Jesus waited for several, for several hours into the storm. He waited several hours before he did anything. He waited until they still had a ways to go before he came to them. Mark tells us in verse 48 of his gospel, he says he saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. Well, how could Jesus see them? John tells us they were three, three and a half miles away. Mark tells us that they were in the middle of the sea. Matthew says that the waves were buffeting against their, against their boat. How could Jesus have seen them straining? I don't think he literally saw them. I think he saw them up on the mountain as he was praying. Jesus saw them because he's God. And God sees everything. And God sees everything all the time. You know, Jesus probably prayed until after midnight before he began to even go to them. When he gets there, the disciples cry out in fear. And Jesus simply says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, it is I. He says, don't be afraid. I am. I am God and I'm here with you. You know, that's how storms are in our lives. Often they come out of nowhere. They hit suddenly and they hit hard. One minute, everything seems just fine, and then all of a sudden, a pandemic. All of a sudden, sickness, disease, cancer, a heart attack, even sometimes unexpected death. Everything seems to be going just great, and then, bam, you lose your job. Your marriage is on the rocks. One minute everything is calm, life is good, God is blessing, and miracles abound everywhere. And then a storm. Remember, the disciples just got done witnessing one of the greatest miracles of all time. Things couldn't have been better. And then all of a sudden, they're scared out of their minds. The same thing happens in our lives. Things seem to be going great, and then something rocks our lives to the core. And when that happens, what do we do? Well, we fight, of course. We fight back hard. That's what the disciples did. One minute they're talking about this miraculous feeding, and then all of a sudden they're rowing as hard as they can with the storm against them, pushing them far off course of where they think they should be going, and they're fighting for their lives. But Mark 6, 48 says, He saw the disciples straining at the oars because the wind was against them. The eyes of God are always on us. You know, for you and for me, life's going along just fine, and then all of a sudden we're straining and we're fighting for our lives, or at least it seems that way. And often we're fighting something that we can't see, something that we don't understand, something more powerful than us. And we find ourselves hopelessly afraid. And so what do we do? We cry out to God. And you know what happens when we do? Jesus hears us. He hears us because his eyes have been on us the entire time. He's been there the whole time. He's walking right along beside us. You know, I wonder, if they hadn't seen Jesus, would he have passed them or would he just continue walking with them? I wonder, what if they hadn't bid him come in? Would he have sent Peter back to the boat and just kept walking? 
I don't know. But we know that Jesus is beside us. He's walking with us all the time. He's watching us battle the storms. And he's just waiting for us to cry out. And when we do, when we finally do, he says, don't be afraid. It is I. He says, I am here. I am aware of the storm, and I'm in control. You know, often in the midst of these storms, like Peter, we say, we don't see God working. We just see the storm. We're rowing. We're fighting hard. We don't, we don't see God's presence. We don't feel his presence because we haven't turned to him. And like Peter, we say, God, if you're really there, if it's really you, prove it to me. Peter said, if it's really you, bid me, to come, bid me come to you. Now, in order for God to prove it to us, in order for God to calm the storm, in order for him to see us through this storm, we have to step out of the boat. We can't keep fighting. We have to stop and we have to give it to God. We have to step out of the boat and we have to begin to move toward him. And that's not an easy thing to do. It's not easy to step out of our safe place in the middle of a storm. But we have to. And as children of God, we know that we have to. And so eventually we do, and we begin that slow walk toward God. But you know, often the storm doesn't go away immediately. The storm is still raging. As we're turning to Him and as we're, as we're trying to exercise our faith, as we're trying to have that faith that we know we should have, the storm is still raging around it. It's still pounding on us. And we're still fighting it often in our own strength. Also, like Peter, often, unfortunately, we look away from God. We look around. We focus on that storm once again, and we begin to sink back down. But Jesus is still right there, and he still reaches out, takes us by the hand. You know what the best thing about Peter's walk is? It's in verse 31 of Matthew 14 where it says, Immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Jesus sent them into the storm, but he wasn't going to let them perish there. Jesus will never let us sink into the storm. If only we call out to him, he will catch us. He will deliver us. Also, I want you to see that Jesus didn't drag Peter back to the boat. They walked together back to the boat. Storms of life are inevitable. Some bigger than others some more frightening than others. But through them all, Jesus is always there. In fact, he knows that the storm is coming. He sees us in the storm. And when the time is right, he comes to us and he lifts us up and then he calms the storm. You know, Jesus allowed his disciples to go through the storm because he knew that they would encounter many more storms in their lives. Storms much worse than this. These same men, these disciples, would later be brought before the authorities. They would be imprisoned. They would be beaten. They would eventually be martyred for their faith. Tradition tells us that Peter and his brother Andrew were both crucified, that Matthew was staked to the ground and beheaded. Bartholomew was flayed by a whip till he died, that Thomas was killed with a spear, that Philip was impaled with iron hooks in his ankles and hung upside down to die. James, the brother of John, was beheaded. James the lesser and James, the brother of Jesus, were thrown off the top of the temple and then beaten to death. Storms will come and storms will go. But always remember, only Jesus can calm the storm. We need to keep our eyes focused on him, especially in the storm, because his eyes are always on us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you this morning that you are with us through the storms of life. Lord, at times like, at times like this right now, Lord, when we don't know what's going on for sure, we don't know what's to come. Lord, where life doesn't seem the same at all. Lord, it is a storm and it's all around us. Lord, help us to remember to keep our eyes on you. But Lord, more than that, we ask that you would calm this storm. Lord, for those that may be listening, that may be going through a personal storm. Lord, maybe it's financial. Lord, maybe it's a problem in marriage. 
Maybe it's loss of a job or a struggle in their job. Maybe it's sickness, disease, or even death of a loved one. Lord, whatever it is, I pray, Lord, that you would, through your Spirit, speak to their heart this morning. Lord, that they would look to you in the midst of the storm. Because, Lord, I know that you are watching over them. Lord, we thank you that you watch over us. We thank you that you love us. We thank you for your promises that we have in the Bible, including that your eyes are always upon us. Lord, thank you for that. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Good morning, Central Baptist Church. I'm uh, the guest to uh, tell you what's going on this week. Uh, Wednesday night, don't forget Zoom Bible study. Pastor Paul's going to take us through the book of Numbers. That's at 630 Wednesday. Thursday night, prayer group's going to get together at 730. So if you have a, a prayer, special request, please message or text. Uh, we want to thank all those that who came out and helped us pass out milk and food to those in need. If you would like to help this week for our community outreach, please give Annabelle a call or myself, and you can help us with either picking up the food or the milk and then uh, help us to distribute it on uh, Wednesday evening and Thursday morning. Thank you and have a wonderful week, and I can't wait to see you all in person.